I'm Charlotte McLeod with the Investing News Network, and here today with me is Chris Marcus, founder of Arcadia Economics. Thanks so much for being here with me online today. Charlotte, great to see you again. Uh, fun talking silver. Price a little higher than last time, so it's a pleasure to be here, and thanks for having me. Yep, very excited to hear your thoughts. So I'll jump right into the questions. I'm actually listening to your book right now, and one of the first things you talk about there, and one of the first things, so it's not a spoiler, is about gold's previous all-time high in 2011 and how that made you want to look more closely at the precious metals. You mentioned it just didn't make sense to you that it reached the level that it did and then it fell. So I wondered if you could start us off by talking about that and what caught your attention there, because I think it could relate to what's going on today. Sure, and certainly probably overlooked, but to me, a very, at least in my life, has been a seminal moment because back in September the pre of 2011, when gold had reached its previous high, it broken through $1,900, which was taken out recently, but at that point was the high. Keep in mind, this was after QE2, the debt ceiling debacle, U.S. getting downgraded by S&P, and it seemed as if the world was in a very similar state of mind as now and seeing that the debts are getting bigger. And <clears throat> it was funny because I had just come back from Europe. I was back home for a day or two and then I had flown out to San Diego because I was actually going to see Rick Rule and it was that Labor Day weekend. I just remember it clearly because I was in a hotel in San Diego and I believe it was the Sunday night. I think it's September 6th. And you have gold's above $1,900 and it's late in the morning, maybe midnight California time. And I get this email from one of the Wall Street Journal alerts saying that the Swiss have just pegged the franc to the euro. Now, to put that in context, going back then, you know, you had trouble in Europe. The dollar was really on the rocks, perhaps more than ever, aside from perhaps even more so than now, even though there's so much, many more of them now. But basically, when the, the, the Euro European Central Bank was already printing, so when the Swiss say, you know, they're, and they're being looked at as the last safe haven, and now they're saying, you know, we're going to start printing to make sure our currency doesn't go up. And I'm, you know, as soon as I read that, I'm like, wow, we might, is, is tonight going to be the night we see gold break through 2000? But instead, there was this plummet in the middle of the night where, uh, it's actually a wild chart. I believe it drops down, comes back up, and then it's, you know, 60 bucks lower by the next morning. And again, it was helpful because by this point, I'd had a really uh, good option trading background. I was running an options trading post, um, worked for a shop that trained us well with decision making. So I had a lot of familiarity with markets and I couldn't figure out how that made sense. And I, I think that was around when I started reading about Ted Butler. And I remember being on the floor and thinking one day, it's like, yeah, I guess I had heard someone say somewhere that maybe gold and silver were manipulated. So it's like, was in there somewhere and then was just trying to figure it out because there was just more money being printed than ever. I never expected the prices to come down as much as they did. Um, I wonder if it were not for the prices coming down then was the dollar closer to going off the tracks back then? Because traditionally, you know, gold and silver eventually soar. And that's when I think people start to notice. And we've seen that now where gold soars through 2000, silver is up a couple of bucks. And I don't know if I would say it's a mania yet, but like you start getting it on the CNBC ticker and then there's more inflows coming in. Um, so that was where a lot of this began. And uh, I guess the book was almost, uh, you know, a decade later of research trying to see either I was missing something or if this came down mainly because banks dumped a lot of volume on a very thin market and an illiquid time and drive the price lower. Um, my understanding and studies of markets is that you can, you can push the beach ball underwater, but watch out when it snaps back which I think we're starting to see now. 
Right. And with that context, I was wondering if you could talk about what we've recently seen in the gold and silver markets. Gold passed its all-time high quite recently, and we did see it then fall back. I know among our listeners, there's been some comments that that was a manipulative move. What's your take on the activity we've seen recently? Yeah, well, I'm going to see if I can pull up this this great chart that I have that I think puts things in perspective quite nicely because, you know, on one hand, I mean, I think the Fed is guaranteeing that not only whether it's 2000 or 3000, I mean, from anyone who's studied Weimar Germany or any previous hyperinflation, especially if you have an Austrian economics background, there's a reason why they can't raise interest rates they, I don't think they really want to. I don't think they ever will. I mean, where you, then you have to start paying all the interest expense on the U.S. debt. All these derivatives start getting triggered. Um, so I think you have a long-term trend that I don't see how it's reversed. In fact, someone asked me, what's the hedge for silver? I don't know. I guess your downside is if the Fed raises interest rates, undoes all the, the quantitative easing, Nancy Pelosi and Donald Trump sit down, play checkers and start cutting the debt. They tell Social Security and Medicare recipients the money's not there. I mean, outside of that, I mean, we're even where we are now and Jerome Powell's getting ready uh, to talk about, they're, 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 they're planning something historic. They're already doing QE and at Jackson Hole, they're getting ready to do something historic so I would suggest that in the long term, you kind of know where things are going to go. In the short term, uh, here's our chart from August 19th. You see the volume here and just so happens when gold just drops off a cliff. Uh, what is this? 40, 50 bucks almost. You see the volume there. Um, you see it again here. Let's see if I have the uh, silver chart up for that day. Here again, you see the drop in the price. And remember, you can sell, the banks can, I, you or I can't, Charlotte, but it's, you know, if you're a banking, you just sell any amount of contracts um, and just hammer it, similar to what we saw in September of 2011. And I might add that at the option trading shop that I worked for, we were specifically trained, you would never execute something like that. Because, for example, if I, let's say I buy a call option and want to hedge that by selling stock, if it's a really thin stock, we just, you know, drift out a couple shares every once in a while because you want to sell for the highest price. But if the markets are closed on a holiday weekend, on a Sunday night, it seems bizarre that, you know, someone with a ton of gold just figured, oh, well, the Swiss are going to start printing their currency. I better get rid of this gold. You've seen the same thing happen repeatedly. Uh, Bart Chilton of the CFTC confirmed it. The Department of Justice has decided to label JP Morgan as a criminal racket and charged uh, their traders with the RICO statute. Um, if it seems baffling that as that's happening, we still see that same pattern that sure looks manipulative to me. I'm stunned by it as well and wish the CFTC or Department of Justice would comment because I think it's affecting investors on at least weekly, if not sometimes daily basis. And I would just suggest to folks that it's not the way I would set it up. I don't think it's legal, moral, ethical, or anything like that. But what I found helpful about trading, it's a good science of differentiating between what I want or what I think is fair and what's going to happen. Because think about it like this. Let's say gold's at $10,000 in two years. I'm not saying that's going to happen. I wouldn't say it's impossible either, but even if gold went to $10,000 in two years, there'd still probably be a couple hundred days where the price was down. So the difference between what if silver just chugged up towards 26, hadn't gone to 29 and then down, I think taking a step back at times is probably uh, the most valuable thing. You know, it's like most metals investors, if they just went on vacation and stopped checking the chart for two or three years, they'd come back and they'd probably be in pretty good shape. So, you know, uh, 
that's at least one way of handling some of these short-term gyrations. Right. I it, So it definitely sounds like you're seeing some similarities between what happened before, what's happening now. And I guess the question that many people want to know the answer to is, what does that mean for the path forward? It's It's definitely difficult to say, but can you shed any light on your thoughts there? Sure. Um, and that's where let's, let's pull up. We're recording this on Wednesday before the uh, Jackson hole speech, just so, I mean, I can understand sometimes that people think I'm making this stuff up because it's so wild. Jerome Powell set to deliver profoundly consequential speech, changing how the fed views inflation. So they've already increased their balance sheet over $7 trillion. To put that in context, remember from the Fed's inception in 1913 to 2008, we had 800 billion, less than a trillion. In the last, now a decade, it's gone up sevenfold. Bernanke, Powell, Janet Yellen all tell us how it's temporary. It's gonna be undone. And then here, I mean, these guys, they're actually talking about you know, pushing inflation higher because it wasn't quite high enough over the last decade. I mean, they're adding trillions at a pop. So I don't think there's, I don't know how quickly it'll happen and gold will be back over 2000. But I mean, like when you have that policy, I don't know I sit here and I try and figure out like, if you tell me I can't invest in gold, silver, mining stocks or any sort of, you know, commodities that are hedged to inflation, like, I don't know what else to do. I mean, look at a share of Tesla. You know what, you know what, the, you know, Tesla is now, at least as of the other day, is more expensive than an ounce of gold. It was over $2,000. And do you have any idea what the, what, what the price of a Tesla share was last September? So about a year ago? Yeah, much less. It's 225 bucks. So it's gone up ninefold. I mean, you have a bond market with 0.6% yield, and the Fed says that their 2% inflation mandate isn't high enough. Is like anybody else noticing that? I mean, I don't. So, I mean, you know, if you told me silver trades below 20 bucks again in the next year, I wouldn't say that's impossible. I think maybe it's getting less likely. Um, you know, one of the things I've been aiming to at least contribute to with the book or the show is at least, I don't think most people have any idea what's been going on. And, you know, it's, you said you, you, you're, you've listened, you started listening to the book and it's like, they don't tell you about that stuff anywhere. And I think that when it's like really put in context, when people be say, okay, yeah, that is weird that gold would plummet in the middle of the night when the last supposed safe haven says they're going to do a hyperinflation campaign. And, um, you know, but I guess the way things are set up now, it's there's a lot going on and people are looking for the next day or the next quarter, or next 10 minutes. Um, but I think if, you, uh, if you're in a marketplace where there's not much patience and you can be the patient person, that alone is probably a good starting point for any uh, any strategy that you're putting into effect. Right, and patience does seem to be very key. When you talk to people who are watching what's going on in silver and gold, it seems a recurring theme is something is gonna happen to change this. People are very convinced about that, and the question is when, and that when question seems to just hang over everything that's going on. How do you deal with that uncertainty in your day-to-day -day life? I think it's a great question. And I would say that that's really the focus of what I do. I've had my days where I'm looking at that Kidco chart and running around the house swearing. And, and you know, at some point it's like, maybe the markets are always gonna do what the markets are gonna do and what we can control is our mental reaction. Um, again, that's why I said before, you know, even if gold went to 10,000 bucks, there's gonna be days where it's down. And in fact, 
the more that we can step away from the day to day. In fact, I love, I've been listening to a lot of audio books. Uh, the Market Wizard series by Jack Schwager is incredible. You hear one great trader after another and when different markets, different time periods, they all describe the same thing. I love watching the movie, The Big Short, because that describes the same thing. And you saw that, you know, they, in their own ways, like one guy got laughed at, you know, another guy's wife or his investors were upset, you know, and maybe, I don't think any of these things are hard. I mean, you, you again, you, <laughs> you can look at the charts, you see the volume, you know, it's like, okay, well, that's weird that the Department of Justice and is arresting them for spoofing and it's continuing. I mean, but it's really that mental part. <clears throat> you know, how do you take a step back? But what I find is helpful is saying, okay, yeah, well, this is actually kind of how it's happened in all these cases. This is why, you know, you, the, the mortgage bubble collapsed when it did. <clears throat> I mean, I would suggest we might be pretty close to the end point of the metal suppression. We're seeing record delivery amounts almost monthly on the COMEX. Um, in a couple of days, we'll find out. It looks still a little early to tell, but looks like maybe another new record. At the same time as metal actually leaving the COMEX. I mean, these guys, I believe some of the banks have been fined for submitting false information. So, I mean, you know, how do I handle all that mentally? I find that, that that's why I left Wall Street. That's why I like gold and silver, but I don't want a gold and silver trust where JP Morgan is the custodian. I find that when you, when you interact with people who do good business, who try to find arrangements where, hey, how can I combine what I do with what you do and what that guy does and everybody wins. So that's why I, I love the mining sector. You have a lot of people that are like that. You have a lot of people that are got into metals for the same reason and they're finding solutions. At least this part is financial. Um, you know, whether SLV actually has the metal I don't know, maybe there's some hidden fee they, they pop on you, but I find when you deal with criminals that have a track record, whether they get caught today or tomorrow, um, I don't know the exact date, but to me, the <laughs> you know how small the silver market is. You just keep piling money in there. And it's like, what are people supposed to think when we're, we're at this point, it's not like there's talks about, you know, well, we really should start cutting the budget. They're just, they're just upping the ante on unlimited. So I would say that, you know, again, that's why it's like, I wish people could just go on vacation, just stop checking it. Um, or, you know, listen to the people that you have on your show. You have some great investors and they all, they all say the same thing, right? I mean, it's like you talk, I know you talk to Rick Rule, you ask him about silver. He says the same thing. So mm -hmm. it's really perhaps, um, you know, that mental adjustment where it's, you know, the more we remain calm and have a good perspective, shockingly, anything in life, you follow that formula and it goes well. Okay. And on that note, in your day-to-day -day life, are you, are you doing any trading or are you in any way related to precious metals or are you a buy and hold kind of person? This is a question that we also posed on Twitter last week. And we we did find that most people are buy and hold type of people. So I just wondered where you stand there. Yeah, well, it's a mix. Um, for a long time, I wasn't doing any trading because I guess one thing maybe better than gold or silver, it took a lot of the money I'd saved, learn marketing, and I wanted to have some sort of business that was sharing something that I enjoyed that was also offering something to the world. So keep in mind that I know sometimes people say if they don't have money to buy gold and silver, but if you understand this stuff, that's, you know, a, a great asset too. Um, you know, as the business came together, it's nice. And I think for most people and then myself as well, starting with some physical bullion is a good way to go for, I invest in the mining shares. I think, you know, obviously there's risks. I mean, maybe one day the government will say we're going to try and nationalize the miners. 
I don't necessarily think that's going to happen. It's actually kind of interesting. If the government tried to nationalize the mining industry, that would actually send the gold and silver prices skyrocketing because we know what happens when government tries to run a business. So you'd have, <laughs> we'd have a real shortage then, but you know, there's different risks. Again, I have a trading background, so there's a degree to which I'm comfortable assuming those. Again, I even trade options on some of these silver mining stocks, which is highly speculative. And in a bear market like the last nine years, you get clobbered pretty good. Although part of that was contingent upon, I made arrangements to arrange my life, whether it was business or where I lived or the different things I did, you know, so it will change over time. With all of that said, ironically, uh, the more I think about it, the, I feel like the less that I do and the less that I touch it and more to just put stuff in there and leave it and not try and say, well, it went up. Is there going to be a correction? I'm going to buy it lower. I don't know. Maybe there is or not. But to me, my, what I feel confident in is that, all right, five or 10 years from now, <laughs> there's some way this racket is still going, then I'm happy. I love taking that bet. What's going to happen tomorrow? I'd be flipping a coin. I mean, you know, we've seen with the manipulation. I mean, you could even have Powell say that <laughs> it's going to have like a 6% inflation target. And if they dump enough paper contracts on gold and silver, you'll see the price go lower. And I would suggest if, you know, there's a possibility that happens, being prepared for that adjusting your trades, knowing that that's until it's finally overwhelmed or manipulated or uh, exposed, which I like to think is closer to the end. Um, but again, uh, partly because I study it a lot, I'm willing to take certain risks that, you know, I understand, you know, I help my mom with some one account of hers and, you know, I, I manage that differently. So, um, you know, there's some mix, but I'm, I'm learning to do as little as possible. And I think there's a lot to be uh, said for that. Okay. And on the note of investing, what are you seeing in terms of interest in precious metals right now? I know there's been a lot of talk that people who were not interested before now we're seeing the high prices they're coming in of course most recently and maybe most notably we had warren buffett news about barrett gold uh he of course has a history in silver as well so maybe talk to me about what level of interest you're seeing from people because you probably with your book and everything would have a sense of that yeah, yeah, it's interesting uh, because I get to talk to a lot of the mining companies and also investors and managers and it's growing. Now, has it grown from like 1% of the population to 1.2%? Maybe, although that's still the thing is, even if you grow a percent with how small this these markets are, especially silver. So I don't know that... Uh, Everyone in the mainstream, I mean, obviously they're not selling some of these tech stocks because they're still like, what if, what if Tesla goes down to like 200 bucks? You know, what if the market's disappointed with whatever Powell says, or, you know, what if, what if God forbid they actually raised interest rates? I mean, it's like at some point, either if they take away the money, then some of that money is going to come out of there and it's like, think with the the chaos you'd have in the banking would flood into silver or they'll keep printing and you know it I think it's just becoming so obvious like people can't ignore it anymore the stuff that you're hearing in the book I think if everybody knew that silver wouldn't be anywhere close to 28 bucks so there's a degree to which you know there's financial crimes I did not you know, not a stretch to say that. They're charged with the RICO statute. Several guys have already pled guilty. They've also all mentioned, was done with knowledge of their supervisors and was widespread practice within the firm. And that also matches everything I've heard officially, unofficially, anecdotally. I mean, you know, so it's like once people start finding out about that, 
you know, I'm not saying it's a mainstream frenzy, although, you know, you start getting gold at 2000, 2500. You've seen how people are coming in. Uh, I bring orders uh, for people to buy gold and silver to a precious metals dealer. They're getting a lot of new people who are buying. This isn't just the gold and silver bugs anymore. Uh, it's probably still a very small percentage of the population, but you don't need 50 per you can't have 50% of the population get into silver. I mean, it's like probably when, I don't know, maybe you break two or 3%. So, and I mean, like, a, you know, as we, we hear the banks are getting clobbered on their shorts. Some of them are running for cover. They've already, HSBC lost $200 million in a day back in March. You know, okay, so what are these, and you can see on the COT report, it's amazing they actually share this for some reason, but there's a field that says the four largest traders who are short silver are collectively short about 244 million ounces. So that means on the, the way from 20 to 28, those four presumably banks lost a collective uh, $2 billion. I mean, that adds up after a little bit. Maybe the fact that the Fed prints it and gives it back in some QE program the next day <clears throat> which is why perhaps it's hard to know the day-to-day -day of when things are going to happen. Um, but again, you know, if people set their investments, there, there are ways you can hedge out the time risk. And for everyone who's tired of waiting and, and doesn't like the manipulation, I get that. Although keep in mind, if the prices really are going to go up and you have a chance to buy something cheaper, again, accepting any trading situation, not even just gold or silver, but anything in life. All right, here's what is, not what... I think Bill should have done or what, you know, your spouse, you wanted them to do. It's whatever is accepting that and you can plan around this and use it to your advantage. Okay. That is some good words of advice. As we're wrapping up here a little bit, I want to ask you if you have any final thoughts for the audience. And I also want to ask you about your event coming up. It's called Silverfest. What should we know about that? Yeah, well, Silverfest, certainly anyone who's invested in silver, interested in silver, wants to find out more about what's going on, anything uh, about what we talked about today. Uh, we, I'm blessed that we have experts from around the world who are gonna be joining us. It's my first, uh, Arcadia's first conference. Um, unfortunately, we can't do it in person this year, but it'll be online September. 11th, 12th, and 13th. Uh, the 11th is more of a party. We'll be watching Trading Places together. Charlotte, hopefully you'll be able to make it there and join us. Um, it just kind of hit me how, you know, there's some a lot of gold events and some gold and silver, but I feel like the silver profile, it's kind of a unique type of person that, you know, is loyal or a little moody and, you know, but it's, it's, and it's nice, uh, we actually started planning this before the price broke $20, but now we have a, a, a price increase to celebrate, really just also connect people. I know a lot of people often feel like I'm the only guy in my town that gets this or they don't have anyone to talk to about it. Um, so, I mean, we, we have quite a guest list and it's gonna be a lot of fun. So anything silver related, it's fortunately free for people to attend. And um, I guess parting thoughts, I would say just in general, like most things in life, trust your gut. Uh, I believe we're witnessing the ultimate emperor is really naked moment. <clears throat> this isn't complex financial analysis. Sometimes I think of it as the greatest hypnotic thought experiment in history where, you know, you have, I mean, it's, really a matter of perspective. Some people say tomorrow Jerome Powell will issue policy. I don't know, you could call that bond market manipulation. But I, I think if things feel weird, and you say, you know, gee, that's odd that everyone's listening to the Fed. And there was Bernanke back then who said subprime was contained. You know, they said the quantitative easing was temporary. Jerome Powell said everything was fine until Corona hit, yet he was doing trillions of dollars of swap lines months before that, was lowering interest rates before we even heard of Corona. And you're thinking, gee, this doesn't add up. 
there's a reason why I think it's unfortunate that a lot of people that we've been told to trust are stealing right in your face. And I think that's not the way I would choose to do it, but as much as possible say, all right, well, it is what it is. Uh, fortunately, you can get silver for 28 bucks. I think when uh, the market really sniffs out what's going on, keep in mind, even JP Morgan got clobbered on their London whale big trade back in uh, 2011 or 12. And I would suggest there's gonna be a point when enough people realize it may be beginning now. We're seeing a run on the metals now when the break point is, um, you know, not letting that dominate your life perhaps is the best thing to go. You know, there's ways to prepare in advance and, um, and just trust your gut. You, you, you got, if you're watching this now, if you watch the last half hour of this, then I would just say trust what feels right to you and the stuff is out there and you're gonna be in good shape. Okay, well, thank you so much for sharing your thoughts. That was great. Um, and we'll be looking forward to your event coming up in September. Um, well, okay. Sure, appreciate that. And thanks again for having me. Great. Once again, I'm Charlotte McLeod with the Investing News Network and this is Chris Marcus with Arcadia Economics.